My name is uh, David Levy Four, and uh, we are now uh, in a seminar, a Zoom seminar with uh, Professor Christine uh, Mousselet. This is a seminar um, kind of coming from theories of regulation and governance that I'm running, but also a seminar on uh, higher education, policy governance and regulation. And uh, I would like to say thank you so much, uh, Christine, for uh, coming uh, and having this uh, uh, talk with us. I will say that uh, that you are a member of the Center of Sociology of Organization, CSO at Science Po and the CNRS Research Unit. Christine leads uh, comparative studies uh, on university governance, higher education policies, and academic labor markets. She has been a DAD fellow, um, the German uh, exchange uh, fellow in uh, 84 and 85, um, a Fulbright and Harvard fellow uh, later in the 90s. Uh, she has led the CSO, CSO from 2000 to 2013, uh, vice president for research uh, of sciences, of sciences Po from 2013, 2018. She is the author of The Long March of French Universities, uh, came out with Rotledge 2005, and The Markets for Academics. Uh, this is a, a Rotledge book from 2009. Her last book, uh, La, La Grande Course de Universités, uh, French, was published by Press Science Polls in 2017. So remember the three books, uh, The Long March of, Univers of French Universities, and the market for academics, and then in French, Le, La Grande Course de univer des Universités. I, I hope I, I'm, you know, <laughs> my, my apologies. <laughs> no so, problem. Thank you again, uh, Christine, for joining us, and the floor is yours, and we just start. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to speak about uh, university governance. Uh, I will mostly rely on two papers, uh, which I publish uh, for one of them quite, uh, it's already quite a long time in 2006. It was already about university governance and what makes a uh, university governance uh, unique and specific. And uh, one year ago in 2021, I published a paper for the annual review of sociology about university governance and there was two parts in the papers. In the paper, one about university governance from the macro perspective, so the national perspective, how do you steer her, her higher education system, if you want, uh, on the one hand, and the second part of the paper was on the on university governance internally, and that's the part I will focus on uh, this, uh, this evening. Um, so, uh, yes, I will have to share my screen first yeah okay i hope you can see it yeah so uh, as david uh told at the beginning i'm a sociologist of organizations and uh, i i think there are really two ways of defining or looking at organizations in the literature on the one hand you find a literature in which organizations are studied as social processes so you look internally what is going on you try to understand how people can work together how they can cooperate uh, that's the main issue uh, of this kind of literature and on the other hand uh, you have literature looking at organizations as particular type of objects and then you find many typologies trying to classify organizations and to differentiate them uh, from yeah, for one uh, between another. And this kind of uh, definitions or this, this kind of uh, way of looking at organizations can be also applied to universities, of course. And this raises uh, different questions. The first one, which has quite disappeared, uh, I must say, but which, which was very discussed in the 60s, was are universities organizations? So in the 60s, you find a lot of literature about this issue, about whether universities are organizations or not. And this kind of disappeared. Uh, now you can, you can find a lot of uh, literature about what kind of organizations uh, universities are. 
And what does it mean in terms of their internal governance? And that's what I try to, I will try to do today uh, in order to understand how governance works in universities. And so I will link the two perspectives, organizations or universities as social processes and organizations as particular type of objects. Uh, I will do that in three time, in three moments. Uh, that's what uh, that's the, the outline of this talk. First, I will uh, try to uh, describe a kind of global trend which happened uh, about universities. Uh, and it's uh, looking at universities first as particular organizations. That was the first movement in the study of organizations. And now we much more have uh, studies looking at the transformation of universities into organizations like others. That will be my first part uh, into the literature, but the main argument I will then uh, have is that even if we have a transformation of universities into organizations as others, nevertheless, there are still two distinctive features in university governance. The first one is that universities have to combine hierarchical, professional, and deliberative coordination. And that's something that we don't find in all kinds of organizations. And the second thing I would like to uh, develop is that research on the one hand and teaching on the other hand are loosely coupled activities and they rely on unclear technologies. That will be my last part. So first, first part, uh, this global trend about the fact that universities have been studied as particular organizations for a long time, and that more recently, the literature has focused on the transformation of universities into organizations as others. So uh, my main argument here is that you can find two main periods in the study of university governance. Uh, before 1960, there was almost nothing about universities as organizations. It really started in the U.S. Uh, with a lot of studies uh, in the 60s about uh, universities. And in these studies, uh, they, you find organizational, organizational studies sorry, on universities. And these studies stress the particularism of universities. These studies do not, uh, they are not agreeing one with another. You have very different models which have been developed at that time. The first one was the collegial model, which was, the, which has been developed by Goodman and Millet, uh, the same year, 1962, the two books uh, appeared. They are not uh, written by organization sociologists. They are people, uh, they are academics, uh, one of them being a president of a, the former president of a university of a, of a U.S. university, and they really argue uh, for universities to be collegial organizations where academics share the same values and they develop consensus and they are able to make decisions through consensus and they develop this model and argue that this model should be the model for universities. But you can find a way, you can find that in the literature, other studies later have rely on the same idea that you have a shared culture in universities. And I, I really like the paper of uh, Burton Clark. Uh, it's not the most uh, well-known paper of Burton Clark. Most of the time people know the, uh, the, the, the university uh, configuration of, uh, of uh, Burton Clark, the coordination model. But uh, this paper of Burton Clark in 1972 is, is about organizational saga, and it shows that the, the way a university is funded has been funded in the US, and the principles that were deployed by the founder of uh, university are very important to understand the development of the university and the university culture. And uh, the academics in this university, the, the students, the parents of the students, the administrative staff, they all belong to these uh, principles or they all follow, they still follow the, the principles which were there 
when the university was founded. And this created an organizational saga with a narrative about the development of the, of the university. That's the first way which uh, uh, for to study universities at that time. The second model uh, was very critical of the collegial model, in fact, and uh, it was uh, developed by Baldrige in 1971. And Baldrige uh, said, uh, it's not true. Universities are not collegial at all. There is no consensus uh, in, within universities. You have people fighting one with another to get resources. It's a very political, uh, organization with a lot of conflict of interest, with a lot of tensions, with a lot of conflicts. And so it developed this idea of a political model that universities are specific because they are very political. And you can again find a, a way to, uh, to further develop this idea in the resource dependence theory uh, of uh, Pfeffer and Salensic. Uh, maybe you don't know that uh, this dependence theory, which has been the resource dependence theory of uh, Pfeffer and Salensic was first developed on a study they led on their own university, where they showed that the departments which were able to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, more resources from the environment were the strongest in the uh, in the in the university, uh, this political model uh, has been then uh, criti uh, criticized by uh, Peter Blau, uh, an organization sociologist, who tried to find some bureaucratic characteristic in universities. So Peter Blau used the Weberian definition of bureaucracies and tried to show that universities share some of the characteristics of uh, the Weberian bureaucracies, but not all of them. And from this point of view, they are specific. And again, you can relate that to a further development, like the idea of professional bureaucracies, which has been developed by Minsberg in 1979, where he developed the idea that universities, but also hospitals, and the same for courts, are made of professionals and administrative staff who have to work together and develop the, 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 this kind of organization. The final model uh, which has been developed, so you can see that there were really a lot of, uh, a lot of studies led in universities at that time. The final model I want to mention, uh, which was developed also in the 70s, was the, is the model developed by Cohen, March and Olson in their famous paper about universities as organized anarchies, a very nice oxymoron, of course, because uh, Anarchies are not very organized most of the time, and organizations shouldn't be anarchical. But uh, they put together these two words in order to describe universities. And they say that within this kind of organization, the way decisions are made is a kind of garbage can model. I will not develop this model because it, I don't have the time to do that. Because you can see that, again, it's the idea is that universities are particular and that they have a specific way of uh, of uh, being run and being governed and further work in this direction have been has been developed by Denis Langley and Rudo with this idea of pluralistic organizations uh, which are a little less complicated than organized hierarchies but also this idea that you have a plurality of missions a plurality of actors and that you have it's difficult to have a central uh, management of this kind of universities. In the 80s, and I take the example of the of the work of Cynthia Ardy here just to illustrate that, uh, this idea that we have different models has been and conflicting one with another has been um, has been a, in a way abandoned. And some uh, some authors say that it depends of the universities you're looking at. So Cynthia Ardi worked on Brazilian universities and she said that some universities can be uh, identified with the collegial model, others with organized anarchies, others with bureaucratic model. So depending on which uh, kind of institutions you are looking at, you will find the different models. But this idea of this four main model was still there. It changed after the, the 80s. Uh, of course, it hasn't been so radical that you uh, change one. Sorry. Christine, maybe yeah. 
we give uh, you you an opportunity to someone to to ask uh, because you did the yes. 20 years of literature a wonderful uh, kind of overview of the social sciences literature with all the great names um anyone wants to to ask uh just come in if not uh we will just uh continue with the the next part from the okay. eight, from the 80s uh, onwards yes uh it's just uh excellent because uh the, the two weeks ago uh or a week ago we had a class on uh on the, the reorganization of, of the universities in Israel, kind of the organizational change that yes. came in the late 90s, beginning of the 2000 uh, MELTS. Uh, and one of the stu my students here is working on the MELTS uh, organization. But um, thank you for this kind of overview of the history of social, social science. And if no one is uh, coming into the discussion, you can continue. Okay, no, no questions? Yeah, okay. So it's a little bit simplistic, of course, to organize things like that. But I think it's kind of show, first of all, that universities were very important in the sociology of organizations as case studies. Um, and that from these case studies, sometimes you have big theories that were developed afterwards, because of course they organized the organized anarchies, for instance, they were not specific to universities. The, the universities are taken as an example, but they say in the paper that there are other kind of organizations which are also organized anarchies. And again, you have the same thing for professional bureaucracies. It's not only universities or the resource dependence theory. So universities were in a way um, a kind of example to develop new models for organizations broader in a, in a broader way. It's it's not what the, it's not the case for the moment. I would say maybe it's a it's a pity, and maybe we should come back to that. But that, that's another issue. Uh, but since the eighties, uh, most studies uh, are very different uh, because they rather focus on whether and how closer to other organizations universities are becoming. So the idea is really that because of the reforms which are brought and most of the time of course is the new public management which is uh, uh, which is uh, brought as an explanation for this transformation the idea is to consider how far from other organizations universities still are because of the transformation of universities and i first mentioned the paper of uh, Brunson and Sally Anderson, which is very often mentioned. This paper is not on organization. It's a paper on the construction of public services into organizations. But as they, they also take the example of uh, universities in the paper, and they show that through the reforms, universities are asked to be more rational, to be to have more defined boundaries, and also to have a stronger hierarchy. Uh, you find the same idea of universities to be constructed uh, into strategic actors in the work of uh, Georg Krücken and Franz Mayer when they developed the idea of the actorhood of universities, something which is really not present in the previous uh, in the previous work. The idea is that universities should have strategies, that it should have develop their strategic plan, and it should act as a single actor and not as a pluralistic uh, one. Uh, this is also, of course, related to the fact that uh, many studies, and I, I could have put many, many names, <laughs> so I decided not to choose one for this, uh, for this uh, showing that there has been an empowerment and a professionalization of academic leaders, and that collegiality uh, within university has been straightened by this evolution. And Again, you find a lot of uh, publications uh, mentioning the importation of managerial solutions within universities in order to transform them into normal, whatever normal means, organizations. So you have the development of performance indicators, for instance. I just mentioned two points here, uh, but also the development of management software linking university members together. Uh, I don't know if you if you you probably know the what Clark Care uh, in the 60s says 
said about universities. In fact, there are two versions of it. One is that a university is a central heating system linking people together. So the idea that you know, you don't have really contacts with people except with the heating, six, uh, heating system of the universities. The same, uh, uh, you know, so I don't know whether this is this version which uh, has been said by Clark Kerr or the other one, which is that the university is a, a park lot um, um, joined together. So always this idea that it's a kind of place where people are not really connected. I think that was really true in the 60s, but now with the software which have been developing in each university, the, there are much more linkages than there were before, probably. So it's just to say that this transformation in the university governance has been quite important in in the since the since the 80s with the multiple transformations which have been developed and i suppose that what you said about israel in universities and the transformation of the structure is going into this direction too so nevertheless and that will be my arguments for the next minutes uh i think that there are still some characteristics of universities that make them particular and that they are still there and that they are still uh, they are still very important if you want to understand how universities are run. The first one is that the governance of university is always a combination of hierarchical, professional and deliberative coordination. And I will just show, uh, it's a very simplistic uh, picture, but I, I try to represent a French university, the structure of a French university. And I think I will, could do that with all the universities in the world. You find these three pillars of coordination. One is a hierarchical coordination, that's the one you find in the administration of the university. So in France, you have an administration head, and then you have a direction, you have um, offices, uh, and is responsible for these directions. There is a human resources uh, direction, there is a financial direction, and so on. Here you find hierarchical uh, links between the administration head and the central administration. Then you also have administrative aids at the faculty level, at the level of each faculty of the university, and administrative staff within each faculty. Again, you find hierarchical um, relationships. In France, the relationship between the central administration and the administration within the faculty is not always very strong. That the reason why I put a smaller arrow, but nevertheless, here you have a hierarchical coordination. On the right, you have what I call the deliberative uh, co uh, coordination. And these are all the deliberative bodies that you can find in a French university. There are probably many more than in many other universities. We have still a lot of councils and committees and so on. But I think that in each university in the world, you can find this kind of councils they have more or less power within each university, but they are still there and they are part of the governance of universities. And in the middle, I put the professional coordination. In France, we call it the political coordination because these people are elected and because they are elected, we call it a political coordination. But I think it's a professional coordination with the, here you have only academics, and I put very small arrows between them because you cannot really speak of a hierarchical relationships between the president and the deans or between the deans and the department heads, between the department heads and the faculty staff. There is a relationship, but it's not really a hierarchical one. And this kind of structure with the three coordination is something very important. Why is it important? I again focus on, in Fran on France, but what we observe in the many studies we led with Stéphanie Mignot Gérard and other colleagues is that each university can choose 
I put shoes into bracket because, because it's not a real choice. You have to cope with what has been done by the predecessor all the time. But uh, between different governance options with the three pillars, you can decide or you can govern with the administration. That's the more frequent case in French universities. The president and the vice president, I would say the presidential team, is really working hand in hand with the administration very very often but when you do that then you have rather difficult di relationships with the deans and you also have rather difficult relationships with the deliberative bodies so you can also choose to govern with the deliberative bodies and to have a very political style of governance but then again you have problems with the deans and you have a lot of problem with the administration because the administration doesn't like the kind of political agreement that you can find. They like when it's a kind of bureaucrat bureaucratic decision making. And again, you can find very few universities, but it sometimes happens in France, where the presidential team is governing with the deans. So the professional uh, coordination is the main one in the university. And again, it's quite difficult with the with the administration in this case. So the fact that you have this combination of different kind of uh, coordination, uh, the different pillars to, to manage and to combine, uh, it's, it makes uh, it specific to, to universities and it, makes, it explains how the governance is developed in, uh, in each institution and why it's differently governed in different institutions. Another, uh, the last uh, part of my of my talk is about another specific or particular characteristics of uh, of universities, and it has to do with the kind of activities which are developed within uh, universities. And what I would like uh, to um, to argue here is that teaching is a loosely coupled activity. Research is a loosely coupled activity, and both of them rely on unclear technologies. And this has an impact on university governance. Uh, Christine, can you uh, explain what is a loosely, uh, loosely coupled activity? Where does it come, the, the idea, and the, what does yeah. it uh, yeah. mean? Yeah, please. I, I will do it. Uh, I don't mean here, I'm not looking here at the relationships between research and teaching. No, I'm not saying that they should be linked or not. That's something different. I just take each of these activities and consider each of them as a loosely coupled activity. And there is, so this notion of loosely, loose coupling has been developed by Carl Wake in a very well-known paper, uh, 19, a seminal paper, 1976, where he developed the idea of education organization or education institutions as loosely coupled systems. And I use this idea of loose coupling in order to, to say that in order to achieve teaching or to achieve research, you don't need to strongly coordinate with the other members of your department or the other members of your research lab, if it's about research. You do not have strong interdependence relationships between the members of the same university. That's the idea I developed. So it's a specific definition of loose coupling. There are many, many definitions of loose coupling. Uh, and I, for me, Loose coupling means that you don't have a strong coordination or you don't have a strong interdependence between the members of the same unit. So let me just take an example. When I teach, I don't need to know what is taught in the room next to my class. And when I teach, I don't really need to know what my students have been taught before and what class they will have after me. You can you mean, say that's you, bad. You, 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 you mean you don't need to, but uh, this is empirical reality, not a normative 
statement. No, it's not a normative statement. statement. So if I, my normative statement would be, it will be better <laughs> that I know what they have been taught before and what they will be taught after my after me. Uh, but most of the time, you don't. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, and we we can teach most of the time without knowing what has been taught before and what will be taught. And I, you can teach without knowing what the other what the other member of the department are teaching at the same moment. And that's kind of the same for research, especially in humanities and social sciences. When I arrive in the morning at my office, I'm almost always the first one because I'm getting early there. I don't need what the others have done the, the day before to start my work. So I'm very happy if my colleagues are there because I can have a coffee with them and discuss with them, but I don't need their work in order to achieve my own work. That's what I mean by the fact that I'm not interdependent with my colleagues, my direct colleagues. I will need maybe that a colleague, maybe in Jerusalem or in New York or whatever, would have achieved something during the night because we are working together, but we're not part of the same university. So we, you can have collective work and much more collective work with colleagues who are not in your university than with colleagues with your, in, within your university. And that's what I mean when I say that research and teaching are loosely coupled activities. It means that I don't need the work of my colleague my direct colleague in my department to achieve my work. Of course, uh, it depends of the discipline where you're working on. And if you are uh, working in physics, for instance, you will have a team with a professor, with assistant, with a group of people working on the same project, but they will not have a lot of connection to the, ne to the team next door. So they will have collective work within a small group, but the small groups within this department, they are not working together most of the time. So, so that's what I mean by the fact that this activity, these two activities, research and teaching are quite particular from this point of view. It's true that with new technologies, and for instance, what happened during the COVID crisis, the fact that we had to teach online uh, and prepare classes uh, online, we, you can see that even for teaching, you could be, uh, you could coordinate more, but not so much with your colleague, but much more with the pedag pedagogical staff, uh, the people who can help you to develop your class online, or with technicians with, uh, who will tell you how to use uh, Zoom or whatever uh, software that can help you. So there are some change nevertheless, but of course, sometimes you have to coordinate a little bit more than before, but it's still loosely coupled, I would say, principally. And it's link, it, it is linked to the characteristics of teaching and research as activities, but it's also something which is maintained by academics. So most of the time we do, <laughs> we try to keep cooperation as reduced as possible. So we, we, don't, we don't want to share our syllabus. We don't want so much to discuss one with another what we will be teaching and this kind of thing. Uh, but also the environment of universities reinforce these uh, characteristics uh, because the environment provides resources that increase our own individual autonomy and our own negotiation power within our institution. So if you get the grant, you get it as, a, as an individual, or you will get it with someone from another university. But because you get a grant, you have more autonomy in your own lab or in your own center, and you also have more negotiation power with uh, the academic leaders uh, if, they, yeah, if they want to 
tell you something. You can say, yes, I I have a grant. I could live with my grant or, yeah, you can negotiate because of your grant. So the administrative staff sometimes try to impose more coordination among academics, but most of the time it doesn't really succeed. And you have many cases in the literature where they show that they introduce a new procedure or something like that, and it fails because it's very difficult to link activities uh, that are uh, loosely coupled. So that was my first point about the fact that research and teaching are loosely coupled activities. The second thing, and this, this time I borrow it to Cohen, March, and Olson, uh, is the idea that research and teaching are, are unclear technologies. So in the definition of organized anarchies, you have three, uh, three points. First, organized anarchies have multiple missions. Second, they rely on unclear technologies. And third, uh, the attention of uh, the people within this kind of uh, organization is a uh, very uh, fluctuant, fl very, um, is always different. They don't put always the same input in, in attention. I just take the unclear technology part of it. I think that's very important because uh, teaching and research are activities that are very difficult to describe. It's very, very difficult to say what you are doing during teaching. And it's very difficult for someone, for an observer, to really say what is going on. And that's the same for research, even if it's less difficult for research than for teaching. It's also very difficult to prescribe. Just say what should be done in terms of research or what should be done in terms of teaching is quite difficult. And it's even more difficult to reproduce because we don't really know what is going on through teaching or through research. And as I always say, it's you can describe, and you have this kind of books, how someone became a Nobel Prize. But it's not because you can describe it, that you can tell the story of a Nobel Prize, that you can that you know how to produce more Nobel Prizes in your own university. You know, that's, you, you don't know how to reproduce a Nobel Prize. The second thing which means, uh, which is important and uh, which uh, makes these activities unclear technologies is that it's very difficult to know what is the, uh, how to, to, to assess the efficiency of this kind of activities. As I said, uh, when I teach, I prefer to believe that what I teach is very important for my students. And that because of me, or thanks to me, they will really be very good after that, that they will get a good job and so on. But I have no, <laughs> no proof of that. How to know uh, what has to be taught, what is important for the students. We, we don't really know, and there are a lot of discussion about that. We can spend hours discussing about that. We don't know how to assess really this kind of activities and really to know what we are producing when, when we are teaching. Or for research, you never know what research will become. And there is also a lot of arguments about the fact that you need fundamental research, but that you don't know exactly what it will bring to the society in the very near future. So it's very difficult to measure what we are doing when we are doing research or when we are doing when, when we teach. And this uh, link, this leads to the fact that there are a lot of controversies and tension about what should be taught or what should be researched. What is a research priority? What should be uh, a research priority? On what should we first develop, put money uh, uh, to, uh, to develop research? Or what is excellent research? And that, that's linked to the fact that we don't exactly master the technologies behind uh, teaching and, and research. And let me finish in order not to be too long. Uh, with the implications this has for university governance. I think there are two main implications. The first one is the very curious and unexpected role of formal structures in universities. In most organizations, formal structures 
are very important in order to organize the coordination and the cooperation within the organization. They do not play this role in universities. It's not because you are in the same department that you are co cooperating with your with the other members of the department. They don't, the formal structures in universities, they, they hardly constrain collective and individual behaviors. But what they do is that they define defensive territories and identities. If you want to know whether a lab does exist, just try to suppress it, suppress it. Then everybody is reacting and saying, oh, that's my lab, that's my center, don't, don't touch it. The same for departments. They don't, uh, they, are, they do not create spaces where people coordinate, but nevertheless, they share an identity, they share a territory, which is very important. That's the first consequence of the fact that you have loosely coupled activities and unclear technology. The second consequence on university governance is, so yeah, sorry, it means for the first one, the unexpected rule of formal structures, that you do not change a university by changing the structure. And you shouldn't so much believe in formal structure as a vector of change within university, much, but much more see them much more see them as a way to define ter territories and think of which kind of territories you want to, you would like to have within the university. The second implication, uh, the second implication for university governance is that leadership becomes a very subtle exercise in universities because hierarchical relationships do not work. And that's one of the characteristics of loosely coupled systems is that the vertical and the horizontal relationships are loose, and so they do not work really as hierarchical relationships. But you also have a poor legitimacy of your own decision as an academic leader because of the unclear technologies and the fact that all the decisions you can make can be very controversial and can be criticized by those who know that the academics who know what better than you what should be taught or what should be uh, researched. And so this leadership on the top of university should cannot rely on the hierarchy or on its own scientific uh, legitimacy. So what I observe in organizations uh, in the universities uh, are different ways in order to, circum to circumvent this kind of uh, implications for uh, university governance. And here I mentioned two of them. One of them is the fact that adhesion is much more important than uh, hierarchy in, uh, in universities and especially adhesion to a specific project or a specific vision for the, for the university is the first way to circumvent uh, this kind of uh, leadership uh, exercise. Uh, and another important one is uh, what my colleague uh, Emmanuel Lazega and his co-author Waterbled have developed as a top-down collegiality, uh, the idea of top-down collegiality. They said that in order, when, when you are in this kind of collegial organization, a way as a leader to, uh, le to find some legitimacy is to ask some of the peers to be your counselors and to work with them. And so they are kind of uh, legitimate the decisions you made uh, because they are your counselors and they are coming from the, they are, your, they are some of the peers. So uh, for instance, you create um, a committee of uh, some of the colleagues uh, of the universities who would be working on a, a project and they will be legitimized by the fact that they are peers and even if they are required to do that by the top leadership, it will be much more legitimate because you rely on something which is close to collegiality but which is a top-down collegiality nevertheless. So I will stop here and will be very happy to answer with your questions. 
uh, about uh, university governance and uh, yeah, <laughs> what I presented today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, this is the uh, literature and. Oh, I, uh, I did it. Uh, you want to to put okay. it again? No, no, um, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. But we we need the literature for later. But on. I will but I will send you I will send you the PowerPoint. So yeah, you, I yeah. also want to have it on the YouTube. I do uh, want it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So please do it again, and then um, I will start with the question. Anyone uh, wants also to 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 comment? Uh, so I, I I will say uh, thank you very much for a uh, wonderful, uh, exciting uh, presentation uh, that for me uh, clarified many things about uh, my frustration within my uh, work, institutions, uh, abilities, uh, efforts to change university. Um, but there is this kind of uh, optimistic uh, um, voice and suggestion. Uh, one is this kind of uh, be in consistent adhesive to your uh, <laughs> to your goal. This is yeah, one yeah. way to change. And the other one is uh, by Emmanuel Langesa that I didn't follow and I'd like you to clear. For, mm. but, but, but before you do it, um, and in addition to that, uh, I wonder how the internal organization of the university interact with the external. Now, I know that this is beyond the scope of the lecture, but we cannot really leave it outside. Mm -hmm. So if I remember your, your papers uh, on, the, on the external, it's competitions, you know, compete, 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 performance, performance, performance. But from your experience, um, is this kind of external forces of competition, and in one one case, the Meltz case, uh, mm -hmm. the Israeli case is the hierarchy, building hierarchies from outside. Does it work? Uh, does it uh, really get into within the university? Can we create competition within the university? Mm -hmm. uh, not resource dependence uh, mm -hmm. yeah. type of competition, but real market-led yeah, competition. Yeah. So if, this, is my, this is my first one. Yes, it it does it does uh, has an impact on the university governance. Uh, I, I would say that competition has always been there in higher education. That's not something which is really new. Uh, first of all, because research is competitive, uh, it's collective and competitive. It has always been uh, the case. What, for me, what is new, and that's something I I I, I developed in a paper published in two in twenty eighteen. Uh, in socioeconomic review is the fact that you don't have only competition at the individual or lab level or between nations, but also now between institutions. And that's something which is quite new. The fact that you had the competition before, it has always been there, but competition between institutions is quite new. And um, not in the US, but in many countries uh, in the, uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I, quite new. I'm, I'm looking, excuse me, I'm, I'm kind of uh, emphasizing the competition by design, the the efforts of the state yes. or the ministries yes. to inf to force yeah. competition yeah. Yeah. Uh, by changing the rules of the game in order to create uh, competition between institutions. Mm -hmm. it, it, exactly, that's, that's not something which is just happening like that. There are two grounds for it, from my point of view. One is the, exactly the one you mentioned. So the governments are developing instruments, uh, organizing more competition among institutions. That's for sure. And the other one is a more private uh, uh, driver of competition. Uh, the fact that, for instance, uh, you can find all information about people, about institutions on the website, or the fact that, for instance, when you take Google Scholar or uh, the um, oh God, the Web of Science, these kind of instruments, they are led by private actors, but they provide a lot of information enabling competition. So through Google Scholar, you may have an H index, G index, whatever index, uh, through Web of Science, you have citation index, you have impact factor and so on. And through that, you also create competition 
because people can look at yeah you can look at my h index if you want if you want to look at me you know <laughs> you can know how many citations i have for this paper on this paper and this also increase competition so it's a private and public uh you have a public you have public and private drivers for competition yeah. And it has a, an impact because um, academic leaders take it; uh, they take it seriously, and they use it as a way to legitimize themselves. So, the competition we, for instance, we have through the research councils when we try to get grants. I mentioned that it provides more autonomy and negotiation power for the people receiving the grants, but it's also a way for the academic leaders to allocate uh, the money within the universities in the different manners. Or the, the evaluation agencies, I don't know whether you have one in, uh, in Israel, we have an evaluation agency in France, evaluating institutions, evaluating labs, and evaluating training programs. And as a lab, if you, are, if, if you have a good evaluation, uh, you may receive more resources internally because the university president can use this result, the fact that you have good labs and mediocre labs, in order to reallocate the money among uh, within the university. So competition plays a role from this point of view because it increases the legitimacy of university president. They can use the results in order to transform their institution internally or to reallocate the money internally. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, excellent uh, answer, but the extent of competition within the university is uh, moderated uh, by competition between institutions. So, the, the most, of the, most of the competition, at least visible, is, is across institutions and the organizations are trying to create an environment which is uh, more fair, fairer. I, hmm, I'm not sure they are creating fairer. <laughs> in fact, what we observe, at least, at least, you know, in France, we have this excellence initiative policy. Uh, so they selected uh, so nine universities were called excellent. They are called EDEX, and they received a lot of money. And it means that for each of these universities, they have to reallocate internally this money, and they did it on a I, I, fair and unfair would be too normative because it would mean, if I say unfair, it would mean that the money has not been allocated to the right people. But at least they use it in order to allocate the money in a less equal way than before, to put more money on some and less on others. So yes, it really transformed from this point of view, the internal way universities are led. And what we also observe is that uh, university leaders have been much more active in identifying the projects they want to support in the competition organized by the state. So we had this competition for excellent institutions, but we also had a competition for excellent lab that was called LabEx, Lab of Excellence, LabEx. And in the, the cases we studied, university presidents had many projects coming from their faculty members, and they decided, when I said the university president, let's say the, the presidential team, they decided which project they will support and they will uh, allow to apply for the competition. So they have, they have much more yeah, they are, they are much more um, engaged in the competition, uh, I would say, and in the decision making from this point of view. And this has been a, quite an important change too. Yeah, yeah. I could see it uh, with a guy, a friend, a colleague from Singapore that so told me about the, how they, um, um, they gave him a, a certificate for being high sighted uh, oh, yes. scholar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, so, don't, we uh, don't do it here. We don't have it either, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it goes informally. Um, um, I have one more question, but I want also to give the audience uh, an opportunity, if there is any, any anyone who wants to come in. If not, I will speak about politics. 
So you mm-hmm. are so, you are an organizational sociologist, and you did um, a wonderful uh, overview. But what what is the role of polit- politics? struggle of power, uh, where is the power in this kind of uh, organizational structure? Is it with some of the academics? Is it out from coming from outside? Or maybe we shouldn't speak about power, we sh- mm-hmm. should speak about ideas or institutions and past dependency uh, and layer- layering of, 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 of different um, modes of con- control mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. yeah so just, to, no, just power for me is a very important uh, notion uh, i'm uh, i've been trained by michel crozier and uh, power relations are really the basic uh, one of the fundamental elements we look at when we study an organization whatever the organization so uh, it's very important but it's true that in universities power relations are are very dispersed, I would say. Uh, You generally do not have only one sector with a strong power or only one person with a strong power and power is not always at the hierarchical level. That's also true in other organizations for sure. But uh, I I wouldn't say that the power is really, that. so I don't see power as an attribute that some people have and that others do not have. Uh, we really define power as a relationship. So the capacity you have to obtain from others, the behavior you would like them to have. So it's related to the definition g- given by Robert Dahl uh, in uh, Who Governs, 1963, if I remember well, the publication date uh, of this uh, of this book. So the idea is really relational. And um, what we, have. most of the time, nevertheless, the power still remain I would say at the level of the academics most of the time. Uh, but it depends of which sector you're looking at and what decision making you're looking. I cannot say in general that power is there or that this person has some power. It's, uh, it, it's uh, really uh, contingent and uh, you don't have the same from one university to another. That what I try to say when I said that a university president has a choice to uh, decide whether he or she will govern with the administration, with the deliberative bodies or with the, with the deans. And of course, according to the choice you make or you can do, depending on, uh, it will define a different uh, map of the power relationships within uh, each university. So I cannot say in general where the power is in uh, in universities. It really depends on each case, and it's most of the time quite dispersed, not really concentrated only on one uh, on one sector. Of course, I know that academics most of the time say that the administration has a, a lot of power. Um, uh, that's not really all the time what we observe, really not. It's a question of negotiation. And again, as I said, if you have a big grant, it will be difficult for the administration to really impose something on you. So it's... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Perhaps you can uh, upload the, the slide with the bibliography for people yeah. to be able to see. Um, I will send it to you, and uh, because I don't know if I can upload it here, can I? Do... Uh, uh, try. If not, nothing happens. Uh, no, I'm not sure because I don't see it. Okay. Oops. Okay. It's not on the slide. No, just just leave it. So. Yeah, I will. Sh- I will send it to you. <laughs> uh, Chris, Professor Christine Musle, uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Uh, eye opening, and I hope to see you all with us uh, again physically and online. Yes, I, and if you come to Paris, yes, please. I, am. Yeah. I will do that. And Thank I will you tell much. you if I come to Jerusalem again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.